Salima Karoma, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. Thank you so much, Trevor, for having me on. Uh, it's an actual pleasure having you on because you are one of the most exciting documentary filmmakers working today, and your new project is bound to get people talking. Dreamland, the burning of Black Wall Street. I mean, this is a story that shockingly very few people in America and around the world actually know about. And when you look at it, it seems like one of the most consequential stories in and around black people building black wealth and then having everything taken away from them merely because of the color of their skin. The question I would have first is, why the title Dreamland when it's about a massacre that was so painful in America? Ooh, what a great question, right? When we tell stories about black people in America, uh, a lot of times the stories are, um, they are dire, they are sad, they are of tra trauma and poverty and all the bad things that have happened to us in this country. Um, and that is true, to you know, this story about Tulsa, this massacre is a, a story about something bad that happened to black people here in America, but it's also a story about this place that was a dream, that felt like a dreamland, right? And like for me, um, like when I watched, I know this is gonna sound so cliche, but when I watched Black Panther, right? And you see Wakanda, right? And you, you can make jokes about it, but it was the, the first time I'd seen black people on screen looks and feel so grand. And right, feel like, right, right. We could have been that, that's what we could be. But it's like, no, Dreamland, we were that. We, we have been that in America before. So I, I wanna tell the story of the Dreamland that was here in the heartland of America. What I love about that title is, is exactly what you just said. And, and I think it's a story that doesn't get told enough. You know, one of, one of the narratives that often gets spun in America about black people is, oh, black people don't wanna work hard. Black people want handouts. Black people, just pull yourselves up. You can get over it. But what this story talks to is a world where black people did exactly that. They overcame all the odds. They built an entire place that was theirs. They made it thrive. And I mean, the title Black Wall Street told it all. Tell me a little bit about that place, the place that people don't often talk about and what made it so special. It's funny because whenever some, uh, when I was pitching this story, a lot of people said Black Wall Street. So like there was a trading floor. There was like a, it was like <laughs> NASDAQ, right? Like, no, it's not Black Wall Street. It's, it's you know, it is a, a metaphor for the financial prosperity that this place called Greenwood, an outskirt of Tulsa, um, mm -hmm. uh, it is a metaphor for, for that. Uh, and this place, Greenwood, the reason it existed is because we're talking about the 1920s, right? This is a booming time in American history. Um, this is, there's an oil boom in Oklahoma, in Tulsa. And what happens is, at the same time, black people are not allowed to go into, you know, uh, uh, white, uh, uh, you know, be w uh, patrons in white businesses. Right, right. Um, right? Um, and so black people at this time in Greenwood, in Tulsa, they had to create their own. So something that is, you know, almost this, uh, you know, you're segregated from going to these places, but then you also have to create your own. They're almost forced to create their own thing, They're forced to create this utopia. A lot of people, uh, when they hear about Tulsa, it, the, the massacre, it happened 100 years ago. And they say, okay, this thing happened 100 years ago. It was an event, and it, it, then it ended, and now it's all done. Uh, but what, what I would love people to understand is that 100 years of the, you know, that 100 years, it's still happening. The massacre is still happening uh, uh, through gentrification, through urban uh, renewal, what they call urban removal, meaning taking people out of their homes and, right. you know, building schools or building uh, uh, universities or, you know, really taking people out of their homes. Um, so this is not a story of 1921. It's a story of 1921 to 2021. What I, what I appreciate about the telling of this story is how it touches on the idea of the compound effects of anything. You know, uh, oftentimes people will talk about, you know, injustice or, or, or massacres or, 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 or any, anything that was done to a group of people and they'll be like, that was so long ago, get over it, blah, blah, blah. But they say it as if they don't understand the compound interest of trauma and pain when they do understand the compound interest of actual money. That's what you touch on in this documentary is how you take from somebody yesterday, it'll infect, it'll, it'll, it'll affect them not just that day, but today and tomorrow and for many tomorrows because that wealth is generational. Absolutely, it's generational wealth. I was talking about this oil boom that happened in the 1920s. Um, like people are still eating off that oil. Families right. 
are still eating off that oil. And, and so um, the fact that this black community was wiped out, all this wealth, all the stuff that was lost, I'm not even, it's like, you know, it's not even just wealth, it's family photos, it's right, uh, history, right. it's knowing of oneself, right? It's completely just um, obliterated. Um, and so the trauma still persists today. And, you know, you can make as many, you can put as many memorials out, you know, do commemorations, but to be real, going down there, people want cold, hard reparations, you know, like they, they, I mean, money is what's going to help. There are, there are still three survivors who are in, um, Tulsa, uh, um, 106 years old, 107 years old, who are still alive, um, who, you know, never saw anything, never saw, wow. barely saw sorry, right? Um, and so I think uh, it's time for us to not just be telling these stories, but actually doing something that's tangible uh, for these people and for these communities. Uh, what's really what's really amazing about the story is, as you said earlier, you, you were pitching it to people and you, you went around trying to find somebody to help you make the project. Um, your teammates now are none other than LeBron James and Mav Carter, a powerhouse team. Um, why did you choose them and why did you think, you know what, these are the perfect people to make this story with? Trevor, you think I chose them? You think I chose... Nobody... You did choose them. You pitched to them, so you chose them. Tre Trevor, nobody wanted... Um, I pitched this many years ago. It wasn't the first time that I pitched this story. And the years ago, no one wanted to do it because it felt too scary. I think that's wow. why I said. I think it felt too scary. It didn't feel real. So I gave up on it for a few years. And then, um, I don't know, one, last year I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to do this. I talked to all the people I needed to talk to. And I literally, I think it sent it out to Spring Hill. And maybe in a matter of days, they came back and were like, let's do this. We want to do this. So like, that's, that's the story. I don't know how it happened, it, you know, uh, but I'm happy that they wanted to do it. Like, they were the first ones who wanted to do it. So that's dope. Thank you, LeBron. Thank you, Maverick. Wow. LeBron with another assist. He never stops. Um, I really hope people watch the story, and uh, I hope you make many, many more documentaries. Congratulations on your journey. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much.